Good morning, everyone. Happy Sabbath. There's a lot of excitement to be in the Lord's house this morning. Just welcome you to come in. If you haven't found your seat, there's plenty of seats available. Lots of pews with comfortable cushions for you to, uh, to sit and enjoy uh, our worship together this morning. I'd like to welcome you to the Cedar Lake Seventh-day Adventist Church, and I'd like to welcome all the parents of juniors who have joined us this Sabbath morning to worship here at Cedar Lake Church. I'm glad that you're able to make us safely, especially those of you who traveled last night. The roads, I understand, were, were uh, a little hazardous, but we'll do anything for our kids, and I'm glad that you made it safely and that you are all here worshiping with us this morning. There's a lot going on at Cedar Lake Church, and if you are a member, I hope that you picked up a, an extra bulletin. Many of us have the, the programs for the junior presentation weekend, but if you're a member, I hope that you did pick up a bulletin because there's a lot uh, listed there because we're an active church for the Lord. Amen? And Dr. Smith this morning has, uh, has something to share with us that is talking about being active for the Lord, huh? Definitely. Welcome, everyone, to Junior Presentation Weekend. And this is February. Tomorrow is what day? Valentine's Day, right? If you forgot. Tomorrow's Valentine's Day. That's the day the world says to someone that they love them. And our theme for Cedar Lake is making members missionaries. And this month, we're showing love to our neighbors by sharing. And sharing, I'd like, uh, there's some gentlemen who have some envelopes in the audience. I'd like you to come and pass them out to everyone who raises their hand who would like to share love with their neighbor. And we're asking you to do that in a special way. March, we have many activities going on. This is a busy church, active for the Lord. And uh, next month we have Pathway to Health and we have Unlock Revelation all coming one right after another in the way the Lord would have it, reaching out to meet people's needs and then addressing their spiritual needs. We want to be able to do that together. So please take one of these envelopes and once you get this envelope in hand, your directive is given to you right now. That is to write down on that envelope someone's name or name of a family that you want to share that with. And inside that envelope is an invitation to those items I mentioned. Plus, there's one other item. It's a love letter from Jesus. Make sure you read that before you give it to them. It will make you feel just wonderful sharing with others. Yes. Oh, envelopes. Hands are up for envelopes. We need one up here. All right. Thank you. Have a wonderful day. We do have uh, some church business that we need to take care of this morning. We have a second reading. It's a transfer out for Laquita Anderson to the Wisconsin Conference SDA Church in Fall River, Wisconsin. And I'll entertain a motion for that at this time. And a second. I'll take one of those as a second. All in favor, raise your hand, please. And any opposed? All right, that is Carrie. Thank you. If you notice in uh, the bulletin, we have our dear sister Barb Norcross, who uh, lost her battle to to cancer, and uh, we're we're actually, you know, I was talking to the family this week, and the family is praising the Lord that she is at rest, and the next face she will see is the face of Jesus on Resurrection Day. Amen? But still, it's difficult when we lose someone that we love because we won't see them until that day. So just please keep the Norcross family lifted up in prayer and just note that a week from tomorrow, on February 21, there will be a viewing at 10 o'clock at the Simpson Family Funeral Home in Sheridan. And that will be followed at 1 o'clock with a memorial service at the SDA Church in Ionia. And more information is listed there in the bulletin. 
A couple more things I want to draw attention to. The Valentine's dinner, it says that it's for February 15. It's actually tomorrow on Valentine's Day, February 14th. And there's information there in the bulletin. But what is on the 15th is the Red Cross Blood Drive on Monday, and that's going to be at the Academy. So we hope to see lots of you there being heroes and saving some lives. Well, it is Sabbath morning, and we are in the Lord's house. And I just, you know, I'm, I'm, every Sabbath is a gift. Every Sabbath is a gift. But I'm just, uh, I feel so humbled and just honored every Sabbath morning to be able to come into this building and have, a, have direct access to the Father, to the God of the universe through Jesus Christ. And now, in the next, I don't know, hour, hour and a half that we get to worship together, we get to worship that God the God of the universe. And today is special too because we have our young people who are going to be leading us into that very special communion with our Heavenly Father. So as we, as we meet together, just send up some silent prayers throughout the service. Pray for these young people as, as they do just that. Lead us into a connection with Jesus Christ and our Heavenly Father through the Spirit. Good morning, church family. We'd like to ask that you join us in uh, praise to the Lord through song. Uh, please sing with us hymn number 86, How Great Thou Art. It's hymn number 86, How Great Thou Art.
God, we praise your name. Again, that's hymn number 30. Seventy-three, holy, holy, holy. And number seventy-three.
Please bow your heads for prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for this day. Thank you for the nice weather outside. Please be with Mr. Glenn and help him to give him the words to speak and help us to gain a blessing. In your name we pray, amen. Please stand as we sing our opening hymn, 569. 569, Pass Me Not, O Gentle Savior. Pass me not, O Gentle Savior, hear my humble cry. While on others thou art calling, do not pass me As far as possible, please kneel. Dear God, I thank you today for everyone that's here and that we could all be gathered on this fine Sabbath. Um, I'd like to ask a special blessing on all the juniors this weekend. Um, not so that we can bring attention to ourselves, but that this class of 2017 can point to you, bring glory to you. Um, I would like to thank you for the blessing of this wonderful church and a beautiful school campus. Thank you for our caring staff, for all our family and friends that could be gathered here today. And in addition with all these praises, I ask that you would be with those who maybe aren't feeling the best or can't be with us today. I think of some families who have recently lost loved ones, be with them. Um, Give them peace and comfort. And I'd also like to ask that you be with Mr. Glenn today as he brings us the message. 
Open our ears and anoint his lips so that through him you may bless all of us. Thank you for all that you do and for all that you will do for us. I ask all these things in your name. Amen. The offering we collect today will be used to advance Adventist television ministries. In North America, the Seventh-day Adventist Church is the leader in television media ministry since television's inception. For more than 65 years, we've been proclaiming God's good news for a better life today and for eternity. The television ministries in the North American Division include Breath of Life with Carlton Bird, Faith for Today with Mike Tucker, it is written with John Bradshaw and Jesus 101 with Elizabeth Talbot. These ministries continue to produce life-changing television programs with new and fresh content. All of these programs can be seen on Hope Channel and Esperanza TV, many other networks across America, and on a wide array of internet, internet platforms. Since the first Adventist television program with William Fagel, George Fendeman and C.D. Brooks, our church has used television to help people take their first steps of faith and prepare them to spend eternity with their creator. Our television programs look very different today, but the mission still remains the same. Adventist media television never stops. Right this moment, someone is hearing about a crucified, risen, and soon coming savior. It might be your neighbor or a family member. Our television pro, oh. Thank you today for your spirit of faithfulness and sacrifice. Producing relevant media is costly, but the benefits are priceless. Will the deacons please stand as we have prayer for the offering. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you so much for bringing us all here today. And please be with the gifts that we give and help them to further your work for your coming. In your name, amen. Amen.
Okay, well, now it's time for the children's story. So the children will come up and grab their baskets and collect the money, please. And come sit up front so I can tell you the children's story. Good morning, kids. Does anybody know what holiday it is tomorrow? What, what is it? Just say it. Valentine's. Valentine's Day. Do you guys know what we do on Valentine's Day? Do you guys know what we do on Valentine's Day? What? What do you think we do? We give cards to other people and heart stuff. Mm -hmm. Okay, so we usually buy little gifts or give cards to our loved ones because we love them and they're special to us, right? So I started thinking, what if on Valentine's Day we not only give gifts to our loved ones, but also to the people we may not get along with? Um, Jesus tells us in Matthew 5, 43 and 44 to love our en enemies. Let me read it to you guys. It says, You have heard that it was said, You shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I say to you, love your enemy, do good to those who hurt you, and pray for those who spitefully misuse you. So we are supposed to be loving and caring to everybody. I have a story for you guys. It says, so there was a little girl named Vanessa who was in fourth grade. Is anybody in fourth grade? Yeah? OK. Well, she was in fourth grade and had a big crush on this little boy named Trevor. On Valentine's Day, Trevor had three chocolate hearts. And he gave one to the teacher and one to his best friend and had one left. Throughout the day, he, Vanessa was trying to hint for him to give her the chocolate. Well, towards the middle of the day, he finally got the point and said, well, I guess I can give it to her. So she took the chocolate and said, thank you. And throughout the rest of the day, he thought about it and thought maybe it was better to give it to somebody who really didn't have any friends and who was kind of very mean to everyone. So he went up to Vanessa and asked her, do you mind giving this chocolate to Rebecca, who really needs it and doesn't have any friends? And she said, no, why, in the, why in, the, in the world would I do that if she's mean to everybody? And finally, she ran back home and said, Mom, 
This kid wanted me to give this chocolate to some mean girl who, who doesn't have any friends. Why would I do that? And her mom explained to her that Jesus loves us all, and he died on the cross for all of us. And she said, well, maybe this girl really needs it, and you can be a friend to her. So the next day, um, Vanessa had changed her mind and decided to give the chocolate to Rebecca. And throughout the day, they started getting to know each other more. And throughout time, they became good friends. So today, for you guys, I have some chocolate kisses. And you're each going to get two. One's going to be for yourself, and one is going to be for you to share. And I encourage you guys to share it with somebody you may not get along with. And when you give it to them, maybe wish them a good day or pray with them. And tell them that you love them, and most importantly, that Jesus loves them. So I'm going to try and see if you guys can pass it around and take two. Amen. Just pass it down. Take two. Thanks, Matt. Okay, so what are you guys going to do with the second piece of chocolate? Give it away. To who? Yes, to somebody who you may not get along with or just needs it, okay? Does any, anybody want to have prayer? No? No one? Okay, I'll pray. Everybody, please bow your heads. Dear Heavenly Father, God, thank you that it's another day and that it's Sabbath. Thank you for each and every child here. I want to ask that you please give us the love you have towards us, and may we, we love everyone and share what you've given for us. I ask that you be with us throughout the rest of this day. May we gain a blessing throughout the service. Be with Mr. Glenn. May he deliver the message, and may it be your words. May we each be open to the message he has to del deliver today. We love you and thank you. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. You guys can go back amen. to your seats. search for love when the night came and it closed in I was alone but it found me where I was hiding and now I'll never ever be the same it was the sweetest voice Called my name, 
saying you're not alone for I am here let me wipe away your every tear my love I never left your side I have seen you through the darkest night and I'm the one who's loved you all your life all of your life your closest friend and everyone else long gone you've had to face the music on your own but there is a sweeter song that calls you home saying you're not alone for I am here let me wipe away your every tear my love I've never your life, all of your life, grateful at you forever, my love will carry you, you're not alone, for I am here, let me wipe away your every tear. Our scripture reading this morning will be John 16, 33. When you get it, say amen. John 16, 33. John 16, 33. Amen. These things I have spoken unto you, that in me ye might have peace. In the world ye shall have tribulation, but be of good cheer, I have overcome the world. Hi. So when I agreed to do this intro, um, I thought a little bit afterward, and then I realized, like, will this look awkward in the bulletin? Let's say, like, intro to speaker, David Glenn, speaker, David Glenn. I was like, well, that, will, will people get confused? But they made a distinction. It's intro to speaker, David Glenn, and speaker, Mr. David Glenn. So that helps. <clears throat> I assure you that this is no coincidence that we have the same name. Um, it was very much on purpose. My dad is David Glenn the fifth, and I am the sixth. So, yeah. So if I if I have hopefully I have a baby boy, because if not, it might cause problems. <laughs> <laughs> My dad enjoys reading, music, corny jokes, puns, stories, and red enchiladas all of which I inherited. So, thanks, Dad. He works as an executive vice president for business development for an IT risk management company. But most of all, what you should know about my dad is that he loves God, he loves his family, and he loves young people, which is a fantastic combination. So it is my pleasure and privilege to introduce to you my dad, David Glenn. What an awesome thing to be introduced by your son. Praise God. Um, thank you, junior class, for um, inviting me to share this time with you. 
Happy Sabbath. Uh, good morning, GLA faculty, students, and families. Is there anybody here from the class of 2017? If you are, please stand up. All right. So, praise God. If you're a parent or a friend of the class of 2017 that came to visit this weekend, please stand up. If you're a student at GLA, please stand up. If you woke up this morning, please stand up. Amen. So thank you just to take a second to turn to the person next to you or the person across the aisle. Say welcome to, welcome to uh, church. Happy Sabbath. Welcome to church. Happy Sabbath. Happy Sabbath. Happy Sabbath, Mr. Carter. Oh, yeah. Happy Sabbath. Happy Sabbath. Happy Sabbath. Sabbath, Jenna. Happy Sabbath. Wait, don't sit down yet. Don't sit down yet. Stay standing up. Now, if we could have your attention for a second, please. How are you guys feeling this morning? So for those of you that have been Pathfinders in my Pathfinder Club, how do you feel this morning? Awesome. So before you sit down, those of you that have been in my, in my Pathfinder Club know that I think that you have to bring your best person to God. I mean, God accepts us for the way that we are, but once God begins to change us, God asks us to bring our best person. So when we worship before him, that we are, um, as we are allowing him to show his vision and his presence in us. So one of the things that we do in, in Pathfinders is, um, uh, when, we, when we do worship, is I ask, the, I ask the Pathfinders, how are you feeling tonight? And they say, I'm alive, I'm alert, and I feel great. And even if you don't feel that way, just saying that sometimes makes you feel that way. So, so try this with me. How are you feeling this morning? I'm alive, I'm alert, and I feel great. All right, one more time. How are you feeling this morning? Awesome. Please be seated. Me too. I feel great too. Um, let's bow our heads for prayer. Father God, we invite your presence here today. Um, we thank you so much for waking us up this morning, uh, for giving us the gift of a Sabbath day of rest, a time when we can lay down our burdens. We don't have to think about work or about school or about a test or about Mrs. Heslap's algebra class or um, any of the things that perplex us, um, that we can just spend time with you and spend time with each other. Lord, guide us today as we uh, open your word. Um, the words that I speak, please help them to be yours. And uh, again, we invite your presence to hear because you've said where there's two or three gathered together in your name that you'll be in, in, uh, in the midst. And I count a lot more than two or three here, Lord. And so we feel your presence today and we ask you to just come into our hearts and our lives. In Jesus' name, amen. So the junior class of 2017, well, the, you'll be seniors and graduate then. Crazy. Um, your aim is in our hands we hold today, in our dreams we hold tomorrow, in our faith we hold forever. One of the things I really like about that aim is that it talks about today, it talks about tomorrow, and it talks about forever, which is the most important thing that we can focus on. I got to, uh, not in person, but see a really cool illustration um, from a student week of prayer on focusing and, and the fact that our lives here on this earth are, are inconsequential as compared to the life in eternity. But there are consequences of our life here, here today. And those things, we have, to, we have to agree with God. We have to make that covenant, that consecration to God every day that says, I'm going to spend time with you. And in the future, I'm going to be with you. And tomorrow I'm going to do that. I'm going to wake up tomorrow and I'm going to make it a new day, and I'm going to pray, and I'm going to spend time with you, God. And then the motto, we can direct the wind. We cannot direct the wind, but we can adjust the sails. And I would say that in this, in this analogy, God is a master sailor, and if you give the, the rudder and the sails into his hands, he can direct the sails for you and adjust the sails for you and, and take you in the right direction. So please turn back with me to our scripture this morning, John 16, 33. I just want to read that one more time. I think it's so powerful. So, so Jesus is, is, is speaking to, uh, to his disciples here, and he says, These things I have spoken to you, that in me you may have peace. In the world you will have tribulations, 
but be of good cheer. I have overcome the world. Our God is a God of courage and of strength, of overcoming obstacles, the God of heaven, the God of earth, the God of everything. So some of you will probably know this story. I heard this story when I was really young, and it remains one of the finest examples of courage and determination that I know of. It was another bitterly cold morning in a rural farming town like so many hundreds of communities throughout the American Midwest as the world was waging the Great War, World War I. The residents in those small towns were not strangers to hard, often back-breaking work. And from early childhood, they learned to value, even love, hard work. Chores were doled out as early and as soon as a child could walk. And, you know, my mom grew up on a, on a cotton farm. My mom's right here. Hi, Mom. Um, my mom grew up on a, on a cotton farm. They grew cotton and uh, green chili and tomatoes and pecans, which I like all those things. I mean, cotton, I'm wearing some cotton today, I guess. But, but I especially like green chili and tomatoes. My mom used to tell me, that she got up in the morning really early and had to, before school, go out and work in the field and, um, and that sometimes she would take a salt shaker out there with her in the tomato field and she would sit down underneath the pota potato plants and while her brothers and sisters were weeding or doing work, she would take her salt shaker and bite into a tomato and put some salt on it, bite into a tomato some more and put some salt on it. And her brothers and sisters say that that was just to get out of chores. My mom says it's just because she really liked tomatoes. Um, but such was the life of the Cunninghams. Father Clint was a water well driller who moved his family ar around a lot in a struggle to keep them fed. On August 4th, 1909, while living in Atlanta, Kansas, Clint's wife bore him a son, who they named Glenn. By the time he was six, little Glenn was already working. He and his nine-year-old brother Floyd were assigned the duty of walking almost two miles to the schoolhouse. That's what they still called them back then. And many really were just abandoned houses that were converted to schools to start the fire in the stove every morning. You see, they didn't have really good insulation back then, and so it would get cold in those little schoolhouses. So they'd start the fire really early in the morning. That way, it, it would not be unbearably cold when the uh, teacher and the other students arrived. It's not very easy to write your lessons on those slates with uh, mittens on or, or gloves on. So they would, uh, they would get there early and light the fire. So one cold morning in February of 1916, Floyd and Glenn arrived in the schoolhouse. They unlocked the door. And imagine this. They unlocked the door, and they were slapped in the face by the cold that just came out of that building. So it was freezing cold. And not only was it freezing cold, but the building was even colder than it was outside. You ever do that? You open a building. You go up to a cabin or something. It hasn't been opened in a while. You open the door, and it's even colder on the inside than the outside. Well, that's what happened this morning. The two boys loaded the large potbelly stove full of firewood, took the kerosene can, soaked the logs thoroughly like they always did. They used kerosene to accelerate the process of ignition. One interesting thing about kerosene is because it's got a little more, a little more oil in it than gasoline does, it burns a little slower. Um, and it's not as combustible. Um, they, used, uh, they soaked in the logs enough to allow the flames to begin consuming the wood. This morning, though, something went terribly wrong. After letting the log soak in the fluid for a bit, Floyd struck a match and dropped it into the pot-bellied stove. Almost instantaneously, the fire took on a life of its own. With a boom, fire exploded everywhere, engulfing Floyd in a horrific sheet of flame. Someone had mistakenly filled the, gas the kerosene container with gasoline. Both of the boys were knocked to the ground by the mini explosion, writhing in unspeakable pain. The flames quickly esca escaped the confines of the stove and violently swarmed through the front room of the schoolhouse. On this day, the older sister, Letha, had gone with them to school that morning. She had been tending to other duties nearby and heard the commotion from the schoolhouse. She saw the menacing flames and rushed to the front door, her horror growing every minute. She managed to pry open the front door and coax her siblings out of the inferno. She ran for help. By the time she got back, Floyd was very, barely alive. He died soon thereafter. Little Glenn mercifully was unconscious for hours and hours as local doctors proclaimed him more dead than alive. They really thought he was going to die. His lower body had been ravaged by the flames. He awoke in the local hospital, his legs swathed in bandages. And then he remembered his brother. He tried to jump up, but his legs didn't work. He was crushed to learn that his older brother, his idol, Floyd, was gone. Glenn was forced to stay in the hospital for weeks. His legs remained bandaged and lifeless as he drifted in and out of consciousness. He overheard whispered communication between his mother and doctors. First, they thought he wouldn't survive. 
Then they decided they needed to amputate his legs for him to live. His mother, thinking of the fact her son had already lost his brother, refused to let them remove his legs. When the bandages were finally removed and Glenn was sent home, it was easy to see why the doctors had been so pessimistic. Glenn had lost all the toes on his left foot. The transverse arch of the foot was ravaged. The flesh on his knee, sh knees and shins had been eaten away by the flames. The right leg was grossly misshapen was and was now a full two inches shorter than the left leg. He still could not walk. The doctors had done all they could. There was no such thing as transplants or skin grafts in those days a century ago. And even if there had been, the Cunninghams were not likely candidates to afford the process. They sent him home with a wheelchair and crutches, advising the family to massage the legs, to stretch the muscles, and restore suppleness to his lower limbs. Cunningham commented on the arduous regimen in his autobiography, American Myler, The Life and Times of Glenn Cunningham. It hurt like mad, Glenn said, especially when my father stretched my legs. When my father would get tired, I'd ask my mother to start massaging my legs, and when she got tired, I'd do it myself. Glenn was determined to walk again and endured the excruciating routine as a necessary evil. What do you do when you face uncertainty? Do you give up? Do you despair? I know by personal experience that a lot of you that I know are natural optimists. Um, it's easy to become despondent sometimes. Today, we have economic problems, everything that's happening in America, everything that's happening overseas, it's easy to get discouraged sometimes. It's easy to wonder how to respond or cope. It's tough to be courageous in, t in face of the things this world sh throws at us. For some of you, it might be a tough test, a class, health of a family member, relationship challenges, or just plain life uncertainty. Um, I've asked a few juniors what they want to be um, or what they want to go to school for. They don't know yet. That's okay, because I still don't know what I want to be when I grow up, so eventually I'll figure that one out. Um, please turn with me in your Bibles to Joshua 1, verse 9. Joshua 1, verse 9. And taking a page from David, put your hand on your head when you have the verse. Joshua 1, verse 9. I see some hands on heads. Good deal. Joshua 1, verse 9. Have I not commanded you, be strong and of good courage. Do not be afraid or dismayed. For the Lord your God is with you wherever you go. God is with us wherever we go. And he promises if we simply agree that he's in charge, he will give us the courage to face any situation, no matter how complex or how frightening. One sunny day in the summer of 1919, Glenn's mother wheeled him into the yard for fresh air. She did that often. He liked to be outside. She went back inside, looked back through the window, and saw that he wasn't in his chair. And she saw him crawling along, or, along the ground. She rushed outside thinking something might be wrong. But by the time she got there, Glenn had crawled over to the picket fence and raised himself up on the picket fence. He then proceeded to drag himself along the fence, stumbling as he tried to will his legs into functioning determined he would walk, all the while resisting his mother's attempts to help. He did this every day for weeks until he had worn a path along the fence. Slowly over a period of months, Glenn's legs began to function to the astonishment of doctors. After he began walking again, he made another discovery. He said it hurt like thunder to walk, but it didn't hurt at all when I ran. So I ran everywhere. For the first five or six years, about all I did was run. He actually started doing something that looked more like hopping fast than running. Remember, his right leg was two inches shorter than his left leg. Um, but before long, young Glenn Cunningham was known throughout the community for his running because he ran everywhere. He once said, I didn't move 10 feet without breaking into a run. I ran and I ran and I ran. By the time he was 12, Glenn, running despite having legs that were still riddled with scars without running everyone his in, in, in his age group in Elkhart, Kansas, where, fam where his family had moved. He went on to run track at Elkhart High School, becoming a miler. In his last high school race, he set a national record, running the mile in a time of 40, uh, 4 minutes, 24.7 seconds. Glenn Cunningham went on to win all kinds of awards, set, set records, and persevere in all that he did. Here's some highlights. At a national collegiate meet in Chicago in 1932, he smashed the NCAA record in the mile, zipping to a time of 4 minutes, 11.1 .1 seconds. No man had ever run the mile faster than an outdoor meet in the United States. Glenn Cunningham had arrived on the national scene, and it would be almost a decade before he would relinquish 
his place as the top middle distance runner in the country. In the summer of 1933, he was a captain of the American track team touring Europe. After running 20 events that summer, Cunningham was given the nickname, the Kansas Iron Man. Cunningham also brought a brand new strategy to running. He'd run the second half of the race faster than the first half. He finished his career with two NCAA titles, eight AAU championships, and a bag of world records, one of which his world one, one mile record of four minutes, 6.8 sec, 6 seconds in 1934 stood for three years. He won 21 of 31 indoor races at Madison Square Garden, despite enduring a tedious regimen of stretching and warm-ups that was longer than any other runners. <clears throat> he kept having circulation problems in his, in his legs, going back to that fire in 1916. Glenn Cunningham admired endurance in others, probably because of how hard he worked in his childhood, dragging his almost lifeless legs behind him as he navigated the picket fence in the backyard. He said, if you stay in the running, if you have endurance, you're bound to win over those who haven't. What do you think Glenn Cunningham's favorite Bible verse was? Do you have a guess? Here's some mumbling. Isaiah 40, 31. So let's turn to Isaiah 40, 31. You can say amen when you get there. And I know, I know a lot of you know this, but those who wait on the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings like eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. You know, I always really enjoyed that verse, but um, David was studying through that, and, and he said, hey, you know, why don't you read the rest of the chapter? There's some really cool stuff there. And, and so I went back, and I, and I did, and there's some amazing things there. But I love verses 28 to 31. Have you not heard? Have you not, or have you not known? Have you not heard? The everlasting God, the Lord, the creator of the ends of the earth, neither faints nor is weary. His understanding is unsearchable. He gives power to the weak, and to those who have no might, he increases strength. Even the youth shall faint and be weary. Even the young men shall utterly fall. That's you guys, law students. You guys are, are young, but sometimes you get tired, right? But those who wait on the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings like eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. Our God is a God of possibilities. There's no problem too big for him, no challenge too great, and no obstacle too complex. Please turn with me in your Bibles to 2 Chronicles chapter 32. Second Chronicles chapter 32. And I want to set some context for the Bible story here. Um, this is a really neat part of the Bible. It talks about, um, talks about Hezekiah, but um, here's some of the context for that. So Solomon reigned for 40 years of the, over, over the whole land of Israel. But because of his rebellion against God, God split the is kingdom of Israel into two kingdoms, Israel and Judah. Some of the most, I mean, you think um, we have a complicated political infrastructure right now, which we do. Interesting. Um, some of the most amazing dramas, wars, political intrigue, and workings of God took place during these times. It's better than fiction. If you dig into your Bible and spend some time studying through First and Second Kings, First and Second Chronicles, um, go back to the time of the Judges, and a little bit after that, there's some amazing stories. Um, I would definitely read the, the prophetic books, stuff like Isaiah, to give context of what was going on spiritually at the time as well. But so, so 13 rulers after Solomon, Hezekiah took the throne. His father Ahaz had blasphemed against God. He sacrificed to idols and he worshiped false gods. When Hezekiah became king, he was 25 years old, so not that much older than a lot of you, much younger than me. Um, the Bible says he did what was right in the sight of the Lord. His father Ahaz was remembered as one of the worst kings of Judah. Hezekiah is remembered as one of the best. He restored the temple, cleaned it, led the people back to God, and the Bible says he made a covenant with God. Dictionary.com defines the word covenant as an agreement usually formed between two or more persons to do or not do something specified. So Hezekiah made an agreement with God that the people of Judah would follow the Lord, and he kept that promise. He followed through with it. Not that he didn't make mistakes, but he followed through with that promise. Hezekiah's uh, reign was a time of reconciliation and holiness. Hezekiah wasn't perfect, but he remained committed to his contract with God. 
There's something interesting in the story of Hezekiah that I hadn't seen before I studied this out, and I'd like to draw your attention to it. If you go right back to uh, uh, 31, so you shouldn't have to turn too far, too far in your Bible, the last verse of, of uh, 2 Chronicles 31, verse 21, it says, And in every work that he began in the service of the house of God, in the law and the commandment to seek his God, he did it with all of his heart, and he prospered. Everything that he did, everything that he did in the service of the house of God, he did it with all of his heart and he prospered. There's a really powerful promise here. It says right here in the Bible, right here, that there's a cause and effect. Every work that we do in service of God, if the, in the law and in the commandment, if we do it with all of our hearts, if we give everything that we have to God, we will prosper in that work. So what work has God given you to do? What work has God given me to do? Do we know how to truly comprehend exactly what it is that God would have us do? So we're going to come back to the story of Hezekiah, but let's turn to uh, 1 Samuel 3. And, you know, this is, this is a story, Jaden. Jaden, you there? This is a story that I'm sure that you remember from Credible in kindergarten. Do you remember the story of Samuel, Jaden? Jaden's my nephew. So if you remember the story of Samuel... Um, Samuel was dedicated to the Lord from birth. And it says in the Bible that when he was weaned, so he was really young, he went to live in the temple with Eli. Now, Eli was, was a really godly man. And so he was, very, he was daily exposed to God's presence. Ellen White says that Samuel's life was one of piety and devotion. Our lesson from Samuel is this simple response to God. And I remember, I remember my mom and my dad reading me the story of Samuel. And, and, you know, doing the voice of God and the voice of Samuel. And, and this, this became very real to me. And it's, it's very simple, but it's very powerful. So if you'll remember the story, um, Samuel hears a voice. Um, he goes into Eli and asks what to do. And uh, so, so this time when God calls him in, in, uh, in 1 Samuel 3.10, it says, Now the Lord came and stood and called as at, as, as at other times, Samuel, Samuel. And Samuel answered, Speak for your servant hears. There's a lesson for us in this, asking God to speak to us, saying, God, I'm listening. Let me know what you would have me do. This uh, provides us with an open heart to hear and accept his words. God gives us courage to complete our tasks. God gives us courage to face our challenges. Our covenant with God needs to be to listen with a meditative heart to what he's asking for us to do. So let's go back to the story of Hezekiah. In 2 Chronicles 32, a second to get back there. In 2 Chronicles 32, there's some incredible political maneuvering going on. So Assyria was a primary political and military power of the time and of the region, and Hezekiah became stuck in a rebellion with Assyria. At first, it was tearing down the shrines to Assyrian gods. Then when Sennacherib came to power in 704 BC, Hezekiah, by the way, against the advice of the prophet Isaiah, formed an alliance with Egypt and became the leader of the revolt against the Assyrian rule. Sometimes we all make mistakes, but if we are committed daily and consecrated to the God of heaven, we will provide us the mechanism to overcome. <clears throat> In 701 BC, Sennacherib laid siege to, to Jerusalem with a huge army that had been pillaging the countryside. Hezekiah used these words to comfort and fortify his people. 2 Chronicles 32, 7 and 8. Be strong and courageous. Do not be afraid or dismayed before the king of Assyria, nor before all the multitude that is with him, for there are more of us than with him. With him is an arm of flesh, but with us is the Lord our God to help us and to fight our battles. And the people were strengthened by the words of Hezekiah, the king of Judah. So the Lord defeats the Assyrians, delivers Jerusalem, and ends the reign of Sennacherib in Assyria. You see, when you have the arm of God beside you, your courage and your strength come from him. This God, our God, is the God of healing broken hearts, of giving life back to dead legs, of compassion, of strength, and of courage. God promises us courage. He promises us sustenance, and he promises eternal life and fellowship with him and each other forever. As Seventh-day Adventist Christians, we've been elected by God, chosen by the highest electorate in the universe for a purpose, ordained to live our very best lives in the service of Jesus Christ, a vibrant life in the power of the Holy Spirit. Every single one of us has been called to it by a specific purpose, by the, God, by the God of creation. And it's not to wait for life to happen to us. You don't just sit around and wait for life to happen. It's about living our best life every day we're alive, 
capturing each moment like the gold that it is and using it with purpose, God's purpose. It was a tragic car accident. A 10-year-old boy lost his arm. He decided to study judo, and he went to a training school. He did really well, so he couldn't understand why. After three months of training, the master had taught him only one move. Sensei, the boy finally said, shouldn't I be learning more moves? This is the only move you know, but this is the only move you'll ever need to know, the sensei said. Not quite understanding, but believing in his teacher, the boy kept training. Several months later, the sensei took the boy to his first tournament. Surprising himself, the boy easily won the first two matches. The third match proved to be more difficult, but after some time, his opponent became impatient and charged. The boy deftly used his one move to win the match. Still amazed by his success, the boy was now in the finals. This time, his opponent was bigger, stronger, and more experienced. For a time, the boy appeared to be overmatched. Concerned the boy might get hurt, the referee called a timeout. He was able to stop the match. He was about to stop the match when the sensei intervened. No, the sensei insisted. Let him continue. Soon after the match resumed, his opponent made a critical mistake. He dropped his guard. Instantly, the boy used his move to pin him. The boy had won the match in the tur tournament. He was a champion. On the way home, the boy and the sensei reviewed every move in each and every match. Then the boy summoned the courage to ask what had been on his mind. Sensei, how did I win the tournament only really knowing one move? You won for two reasons, the sensei answered. First, you've almost mastered one of the most difficult throws in judo. And second, the only known defense for that move is for the opponent to grab your left arm. God not only knows you, he knows the playing field. No matter the challenge, he has the answer. He wants to use you starting today as you are, and if you let him, he'll help you grow. It doesn't matter to God if you made a mistake yesterday. It doesn't matter to God if you did something that just makes you feel ashamed. As long as you can go to God and give those, to, those things to him, God will take you every time just as you are. And then if you spend every day with him, if you wake up every morning with him, and if you are as, as committed to a relationship with God as you are with your girlfriend or boyfriend or your parents or your, or your children or your teachers, whatever those things are, if you spend that time with God, pretty soon you'll start walking with God just in, in, in this idea of praying without ceasing, of being present with God every single moment, every single day, looking towards eternity, but making every moment count becomes um, significant. So let's look, uh, let's look at Matthew 19, verse 26. Matthew 19, verse 26. But Jesus looked at them and said to them, With men this is impossible, but with God all things are possible. We serve a God of possibilities, of big ideas, a God for whom nothing is impossible. There is a um, professor of psychology and management at the Drucker School at Claremont College in California, and his name is really hard to pronounce, but I'm going to try it. It's Mihai Csikszent Mihai. If I showed you how it was spelled, it would wonder too, but... He's the director of the Quality of Life Research Center that studies positive psychology, that's human strengths like optimism, creativity, intrinsic motivation, and responsibility. He says, many of us spend many hours each week watching celebrated athletes playing in enormous stadiums. Instead of making music, we listen to platinum records cut by millionaire musicians. Instead of making art, we go to museums and admire paintings. We do not run risks acting on our beliefs, but occupy hours each day watching actors who pretend to have adventures engaged in mock meaningful action. This vicarious participation is able to mask, at least temporarily, the underlying emptiness of wasted time, but it's a very pale substitute for attention invested in real challenges. The flow experience that results from the use of skills leads to growth. Passive entertainment leads nowhere. Collectively, we're wasting each year the equivalent of millions of years of human consciousness. The energy that could be used to focus on complex goals to provide enjoyable growth is squandered on patterns of stimulation that only mimic reality. I really appreciated um, uh, Andrea's skit this morning, and, and it said Andrea and friends in the bulletin, but Andrea's skit this morning, in really talking about, about um, how much of your life you give to God. You know, you slice off life for television and Instagram and, and social media and all these other things, and then sometimes we have a few crumbs left for God. How much better is our life if we start the day with God, if we make the commitment to God that thing that is most important to us, the thing that I've recognized is that when I do that, God makes time for the rest of the things that I have to do in my life. 
God has called us to a life of deep meaning and conviction, not merely as spectators, but as participants, deeply engaged in our own relationship with him and with those around us, inviting his daily participation in our lives. Um, we were chosen, I'm sorry, let's go to uh, Ephesians 1, 3 to 6. Ephesians 1, verses 3 to 6. <clears throat> Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ, just as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and without blame before him in love, having predestined us to adoption as sons by Jesus Christ to himself, according to the good pleasure of his will, to the praise and glory of his grace, by which he made us accepted in the Beloved. We were chosen from before the foundation of the world. Your calling, that thing that God wants you to do, was ordained before you were born. Each and every one of us has a special purpose in him. Our part is to accept that call and move forward in faith to accomplish what God asks us to do. There's a general calling to us Christians in the Gospel Commission and going and making disciples of those around us. But there are also specific roles that the God of heaven would have us perform. Ephesians 2.10 says, For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. I love that word, workmanship. The creator didn't simply casually throw out a draft copy of what he thought a human might look like. He fashioned us. He crafted us. He made us perfectly to his specifications. We are intentional creations of God. With this comes some very heavy responsibility. The responsibility of choosing our high-value activities of questioning what we're doing consistently with the idea, am I engaging in the highest value activity right now for my God, my family, myself, and my community? Are we as Christians perceived as being strong, hard workers? Do our classmates look at us and say, wow, they're doing their very best? Do our parents look at us and say, wow, he really cleaned his room well? Um, the reflection of God's character should be present every day in everything that we do. So how do we reflect God's character? Peter Lord's an author and a minister, and I found a really cool quote from him. Do you want to know how to become godly? Just hang around God a lot. If we commit to regularly scheduled interactions with God, we begin to reflect who he is. It's a point of human nature that things we're exposed to most we become like. His purpose for us specifically as individuals become, will become plain and clear to us. In Steps to Christ, chapter 9, it says, As we meditate upon the perfections of the Savior... We shall desire to be wholly transformed and renewed in the image of his purity. There shall be a hungering and thirsting of soul to become him like who, who we adore. The more our thoughts are upon Christ, the more we shall speak of him to others and represent him to the world. A couple of paragraphs down. By the way, do you get, is, is school ever tough? Do you ever have a hard time studying? Is it hard to pay attention sometimes? I'm, yeah, squirrel. Yeah, me too. Um, so a couple of paragraphs down, it says, there's nothing more calculated to strengthen the intellect than the study of the scriptures. No other book is so potent to elevate the thoughts, to give vigor to the faculties as the broad ennobling truths of the Bible. If God's word were studied as it should be, men would have a breadth of mind, a nobility of character, and a stability of purpose that's rarely seen in, those in these times. So in reading the Bible, in prayer and meditation, we open ourselves not, to a, not only to a more meaningful relationship with God and the reflection of his character, but also to increasing our brain power. I don't know about you, but I can use all the brain power I can get. So turn with me to Luke 2, verse 52. And nobody's running towards the door yet, so I'm assuming I have a couple more minutes. Uh, Luke 2, verse 52. Luke 2, verse 52 is a very short verse, but it's very powerful. And Jesus increased in wisdom and in stature and in favor with God and with man. Christ gives us an example in Luke that's pretty plain. There are four key elements in this passage. He had an increase in wisdom. So God in, it calls us to increase our knowledge. An increase in stature. 
This applies to our physical aspect. This doesn't mean you can make yourself get taller um, or shorter, but you can make yourself get less wide, which I need to work on one of my New Year's resolutions. Even those of us who are already grown up should be committed to making good choices as it pertains to diet and exercise, building our physical health so that we're able to do the things that God asks us to do. In favor with God is our spiritual growth. In favor with man is our interpersonal relationships. Jesus grew, and he's asking us to grow as well. God has, not, has called us not to be stale and to stagnate, but to grow. Christian fellowship is another key component of living an epic Christian life. When God created man in his image, he also created the need for relationship. And in Proverbs 27, 17, it says, As iron sharpens iron, so man sharpens the countenance of his friend. John Donne was a 17th century English poet and an Anglican priest. And in an excerpt of one of his writings, it says, No man is an island entire of itself. Every man is a piece of the continent, a part of the main. We stand together or we fall alone. One of the great tragedies in modern society are those people who do not have others around them to share the journey with. It's one of the great powers of being a Seventh-day Adventist Christian is there's always someone to share the journey with. Whether by their own choice or by the force of circumstance, there are people that live in isolation from the world around them. It's our responsibility as Christians to ensure that we're participating in the community for our own benefit, but also in looking for opportunities to reach others and to pull them into direct interaction, to minister and help fulfill that most basic desire for human contact. Now, this happened a few years ago, but I had had a really hard week, and um, I had, uh, I, I, as David mentioned, I'm, I work in business development, and, and I'm, by nature, I'm a really shy person, and I'm an introvert, and I don't like being around a lot of people, so I had spent this whole week with a fake smile plastered, not fake, but with a, smi a forced smile plastered on my face in meetings early morning to late in the evening, and I got home Friday night, and I just... All I wanted to do is rest. I didn't want to be around other people. And uh, I remember that uh, instead of going to church, I decided to stay home and relax. About 11 a.m., I got a text message on my phone um, from somebody that doesn't text very often. It's Tim Morgan. He does, Tim, Timothy's dad he doesn't like texting very much. But uh, he said, missing you at church. He's not really a big texter. Um, back then... They didn't have unlimited texts, and uh, he thought it was kind of a waste of money. And I remember he'd always tell Tracy, Tracy, you only have three texts left for this month. And, and so here, here I was getting this text from Tim saying, missing you at church. So I texted him back and said, thanks, you texted me? And he texted me back and said, you're worth it. That interaction was a powerful, powerful sermon to me. Not only did someone notice I wasn't there, but it was worth it enough for them to interact with me in a way that was outside their comfort zone. God is a God of chain reactions. He encourages us to do things that are not just for that action and that blessing, but for what happens in the long haul. Praising and prayer are our outgoing communication channels with God. So as we talk about, again, God being this God of courage, this God that, that can fix broken, broken people, that can fix scarred legs, and, and uh, um, that can make us be our best selves, it is important for us to think about this idea of living an epic Christian life. So in the end, when God says to you, well done, thou good and faithful servant, you can look back and you can say that you allowed God to work through your life every single day, that you started every moment with God. Here's some components of living an, uh, an epic life. Participate in life. Accept God's calling and daily invite his participation in our lives. Commit to growth. Choose our highest value activities. Reflect God's character by spending time in study and prayer. Engagement in Christian fellowship, praying for each other, listening to God speak. I challenge each one of you to reach outside your comfort zone this week. Share the intention of what you want to do with someone else. Then go and do it. Talk to someone you've been afraid to talk to before. What would you really do for God if you knew you could not fail? A couple more verses here. Let's go to Hebrews 12, verses 1 and 2. Hebrews 12, verses 1 and, 1 and 2. So if you'll remember, this is after Hebrews 11, the faith chapter that talks about Abraham's faith, that talks about Jacob's faith, that talks about Joseph's faith. But in Hebrews 12, 1 and 2, I think this is appropriate considering the story of Glenn Cunningham. Therefore we also, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight in the sin which so easily ensnares us, and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us, 
looking into Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and has sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Courage to finish the race, endurance from the God of heaven, and acceptance of the free gift of salvation that Jesus bought for us with his blood on Calvary's cross. Um, one more verse here. Uh, let's turn to Jude 1, 24 and 25. My dad ends his sermons with this a lot, and it always makes me feel just invigorated for the week when I hear this. Now unto him who is able to keep you from falling. He's able to keep us from falling. He can keep us from falling every time. And for, to present you faultless before the presence of his glory with exceeding joy. To God our Savior, who alone is wise, be glory, majesty, dominion, and power, both now and forever. Amen. as we sing our closing hymn, number 619, Lead On, O King Eternal, number 619.